Hello. Thank you for tuning into this webinar. I hope you'll find it valuable and insightful. My name is Sophie Linwald and I work for BES Healthcare and I've been organizing the Do No Harm, Know Your Power webinars. Before playing through the webinar, I thought I'd take a moment of your time to briefly explain our campaign, Do No Harm, Know Your Power. The campaign is inspired by changes we've seen in the healthcare system due to time pressures and financial demands, which has led clinicians to make clinical decisions that don't always lead to the best outcome for the client. These challenges have adversely affected patients, leading to an increase in harm. To change this, to do no harm, we want to empower clinicians to say no to equipment that has not been tested to its appropriate standard and give them the power to bring clinical recommendation back into the buying process and make right decisions for the best possible clinical outcome. BES works with various bodies, charities and industry experts to make information on standards, equipment and best practice guidelines accessible to you. We also offer free training where needed. These webinars might not change the industry overnight. Still, we feel that they are the beginning of a movement to inspire clinicians, manufacturers, and end users to look for alternative solutions that fit best clinical practice. That was my moment. Thank you for listening and enjoy the webinar. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to our first webinar from our Do No Harm, Know Your Power campaign. campaign. Um, today we'll talk about standards and best practices in seating and in postural management and how to sort of apply that into everyday working life. With me today I have John Tiernan and I have Mark Rotel and my colleague Diane Hargrove um, with whom I'll share my hosting duties today. Um, and can I just say again thank you so much um, for taking the time to to join us today. I know that there's been, you know, a few cancellations and last minute changes to the format. So, um, yeah, thank you again um, for taking your time and sharing your knowledge to our viewers today. Um, so I thought it might, it might be a good idea to have sort of a brief introduction about um, our panelists. Um, so, John, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, where do you work and um, what's your background and how does seating and best practices sort of relate into your everyday work life? Okay, yeah, thank you, Sophie. Uh, my name is John Tiernan. I work with Enable Ireland SeaTech, which is a special seating service based in, in South Dublin in Ireland. Uh, we provide an assessment, prescription, selection, as well as design and manufacture service. So the system works slightly differently here to how it works in the UK. Mm -hmm in that general wheelchair prescription is undertaken primarily by therapists in the community uh, and uh, they liaise directly with suppliers in the supply of equipment for, for the more straightforward um, and some more complex cases. And then when cases get much more complex, they're referred into special seating services such as their own or that run by the CRC or one or two private companies as well are providing special seating services. So uh, my personal background is mechanical engineering, and then I specialized in biomedical engineering, and I've been working in the area of what we would term clinical engineering since 2001, so 20 years in, in the role this year. Um, yeah. And I've been wow. working in, in the front line assessment, prescription, design, manufacture, and issue supply and commissioning of, of equipment for, for that time. Uh, and things have evolved. Um, back in 2001, when I started work, because of the background I Done research in wheelchair design prior to taking up the post, um, I'd have been aware of the wheelchair standards, the 7176 series of wheelchair standards, uh, mm -hmm. and the seating standards, the 16840 series of seating standards, were just in their infancy. There were only four standards at that point in time under development. So I would have been aware of those because, as I say, I had done, well, I didn't say, but I, I had done a research master's and the topic of that was wheelchair design. So as part of that research, I would have become aware of standards. Mm. Um, and for those who, of you who remember him, Jeff Bardsley was at the helm at the time of the wheelchair standards development. And he'd written a very nice, succinct article about standards and their importance and, and the different ones that were under development at the time. So... I think there's something like 26 or 27 wheelchair standards now and the, the seating standards are up at about 14 or 15. So they're growing as they develop and what, what they found that the teams work in the standards development, they might be working in a specific area and mm. that area can kind of grow legs 
and the ground is seven and seven and seven so one standard yeah. then blossoms into four or five different standards yeah um why are they important or uh, is that the question or how do they apply kind of in our context a bit of both yeah, yes yeah. yeah sort of like uh, how do you uh, how do you how do you apply it into your everyday work life um, yeah. i think we'll have a brief introduction of, of mark as well and then we'll sort of like yeah. go into the nitty-gritty um afterwards okay so just briefly um i suppose an awareness of them would be the first the first bit just mm -hmm. knowing that they're there and then not all would necessarily apply all the time and a lot would apply directly to manufacturers um, mm. But there will be some, and the obvious ones, which I think we're going to touch on later, both of us, uh, would be transport safety, fire safety, and, yeah. and some of those aspects. So we'll, we'll come back to that in more detail. Um, yeah. But that's probably enough for me for now. If <laughs> have a word. Thank you, John. And how about you, how about you Mark? What's, uh, what's your background and uh, how does standards um, relate to your, your work practice? Great. Yeah. So my name is Mark Botel. Um, I'm, I'm the relative novice here today um, <laughs> with 10 years experience in posture and mobility, um, mainly in special seating, um, but also quite involved in a pressure ulcer service where we do some practical stuff with people to try and offload pressure areas in the community. Um, so, yeah, I, I trained uh, 10 years ago in Oxford and now I'm in Swansea and I'm currently deputy head of rehab engineering here. Um, I am a seating assessor, so I see people with complex seating needs as part of our special seating service. Um, so it's the 2% most complex um, postural needs in um, South Wales, yeah. our, little, our little pocket of the world. Um, and, and like I said, uh, I've got a special interest in, in pressure ulcers as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of standards, I'd say I'm um, a reasonably reluctant standards complier. Mm. Um, and don't like to read lots and don't like to um, get slowed down in what I want to do with my patients. Mm. And so if that feels familiar to you, then hopefully I can encourage you with um, in this session and kind of uh, be part of um, flying the flag with the importance as well as a reluctant person. <laughs> yeah, oh, that sounds great. That sounds great. Well, um, let's get started with the, uh, the first question then. Um, the first question might be a little bit um, loaded, but when it comes to standard standards, do they work and do they matter? Not at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Thank you, um, I'll be today then. <laughs> no, um, actually, I had a quick look on the um, PMG website. Fantastic resource for standards and a couple of definitions. I'd like to just pull straight off here. Um, to yeah, do standards. Yeah. They're defining the agreed ways of doing things. I think that's a fantastic, simple way of describing what a standard is. And some examples might include def defining what a medical device is or does, uh, maybe how it should be used, what it should measure and how it can perform, as well as there's some, being some standards of how something should be tested. Hmm. And so the important thing is to do with um, ensuring quality yeah. and making sure things are safe, reliable. Um, but for us in, in, a, in a field of working as professionals, it's about singing from the same hymn sheet, if you like. It's about speaking mm -hmm. the same language um and making sure that we have a agreed standard or standardized um expectations in our in our care and what we provide people um a little example of how important um standards are if you think of um the air flight industry aviation mm -hmm. um yeah. i think we're all thankful that there are standards that apply <laughs> um and so it applies on different levels the other little thing to throw in is how standards can make things easier for us if there weren't standards around how we plug things in to power them then we'd have to have 100 different power sockets in our houses mm -hmm. and this sort of thing and be difficult to do things so as well as quality um it's, it, it enables us to do things in a more effective way at times as well and that's where there needs to be a good balance in how it's written yeah um so do they do they work um yes if they're used appropriately and they mm. say certainly matter, yeah. <laughs> Is that something you recognize as well, John, that, that the standards are really helpful and to sort of like have a standard way of doing it, you know, not just, you know, when it comes to your own workplace, but also when you're working, you know, alongside, uh, alongside other services? Yes, absolutely. Um, and whether it's standards or best practice, I was just thinking about this yesterday. Um, you know, we, we, we could, you can't literally use the terms interchangeably but you kind of can and best practice is typically an agreed way of doing something and agreed mm -hmm. by people in the know for want of a better term 
Um, so in effect, you've had other people do the thinking for you. <laughs> and those people have, have credentials and it's kind of undermined by the fact, underlined by the fact that these things are run through organizations such as the British Standards Institute or the International Standards Organization. So that gives kind of the, the, the kudos to, to what's there. So yes, by, by relying on a standard, you're, you're, it's kind of taking the responsibility, not taking it away, but it's, it's, it's lightening the load, shall we say. Um, nice. Yeah, they're there to protect us as well, I think, aren't they? That's the other thing to yeah. make clear, yeah. to protect the end user, um, but also us as professionals, uh, the institutions we work for, um, and even those that in, invest or commission what we do, um, if, they, if they have assurances from the standards, then um, there's protection there. Very good point. Yeah, that, sort of, that sort of relates to the, uh, the second uh, question of today as well, where we talk about when it comes to sort of like providing a good um, clinical outcome, um, why do you think it's important to follow the standards? Yeah, yeah, that, that does really re reiterate the point there. Um, mm. And I suppose to come back to what I mentioned earlier, if you think about how standards have come about, how they've been evolved or how they have evolved, um, basically it's at an international level, a working group is set up and that brings together the top minds in the world in a specific field. So for mm -hmm. us, it's wheelchairs and seating, obviously. Um, so you've got people who are highly experienced, highly educated in their sector, potentially have a, a strong research track record coming together and there are differing views and there are heated discussions mm -hmm. um, yeah. and um, uh, uh, you know it's not for everyone but some people you know in, enjoy the challenge of that um, and then when, once the standards are developed they sort of become de facto best practice and in the absence mm -hmm. of legislation uh, they can be relied on from, from that point of view to make, ensure the best practice is, is being applied um, a case in point would be, uh, well, two, in fact, one would be ISO, uh, again, sorry to throw out all the numbers, but there are really only two sets of numbers to know, 7176 for wheelchairs and 16840 for seating. And yeah. 16840 part one has a clinical guideline attached to it. And for us, we provide seating assessment training as, as part of our service in, in CTEC. We, we train other professionals in how to undertake seating assessments. And we rely heavily on 16840 part one for that mm. and the basis of that. And it ties in what's termed the MAT evaluation and a, and a standardized method of assessing someone's seating requirements and translating those seating requirements into equipment solutions. So we mm. would rely on them for, from that perspective. Another best practice, and I'll, I'll touch on this later, is the transport guidelines best practice document. So mm. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, Another reason that it's good to follow them, and, and we've touched on this already, is um, risk assessment. Uh, mm. When I talk to trainees about risk assessment, basically I try, I try to throw out the idea that getting out of bed in the morning carries an inherent risk. Everything we do mm. carries an inherent risk. Not getting out of bed in the morning carries an inherent yeah. risk. <laughs> so we, we are constantly undertaking risks and subconscious risk assessments in our minds, crossing the road, getting into our car, every, everything we do almost constitute, mm. involves a, a risk assessment of some, of some degree. And standards are a fantastic boon when you're undertaking risk assessments in a particular area. They provide a baseline. Nothing is certain, but they mm. do provide a baseline from which you're working mm. when, you, when you're undertaking a risk assessment. So yeah. you're, you're dealing with that inherent uncertainty, but by knowing that something conforms to a specific standard, and let's take the obvious one of it, the crash test standard for wheelchairs, mm -hmm. knowing that a wheelchair is crash tested doesn't give you any guarantees, but it gives you a certain degree of certainty in mm -hmm. relation to, to how that, that wheelchair will perform. So they offer a level of confidence that helps inform your, your good clinical practice. Great. Um, Mark, do anything you do want to, to sort of add to that that point? Yeah, just thought that was a really interesting point about uncertainty, and I guess that's mm -hmm. where standards come is to try and help us to be more more certain. And um, in the field of posture management, there's there's a lot of uncertainty, um, and that's perhaps why we, for the practice of postural management, in terms of what we do with our patients, there isn't too much in terms of standards. There is a lot around the equipment and the things we provide, perhaps, mm -hmm. but how we do things is. 
there's not it's not it's quite poorly standardized i suppose and that's because i suppose some you might say it's as much as of an art as it is as a science and um, there's a lot of uncertainty every person every scenario is is somewhat different um so it's about finding those common principles and guiding guiding principles um, and that's where um john mentioned best practice is um often talked about more in posture management than than standards are um mm. but there, there are times to to use both would yeah. there ever be just sorry to butt in there would there ever be yeah, a situation no you might find where you would actually go against the standard and for a particular reason for a particular client for a particular outcome and how would you go about that if if you were to do that yes um uh, i think it's important that we can understand that we might um but to put measures in place when we do so to understand that we've gone beyond and and therefore to be really clear in our rationale uh, in terms of posture management you're often working with a patient other professionals carers towards coming to that decision so it's not an isolated decision as a individual um maybe a accountability from a second opinion might be important if you're going outside of standards or best practice um and yeah so well reasoning it um and recording it um john mentioned risk assessment if if you can show in the court of law or or wherever else if questioned um where your rationale is and how you weighed up certain risks um, and, and in doing so you you decided not to adhere to that letter of the, the standard um, mm. and, and then importantly then how you review that um, when do you come back and check that it's still appropriate in there some of the measures that might be important to put in place yeah that's interesting Okay, so um, yeah, John, you mentioned a little bit about um, you know ISO standards and working group. I'm very apologetic about you know using the uh, the various sort of like ISO standards numbers. Um, but when it comes to you know finding information about these standards, where, where what sort of like channel do you guys go to to gain that sort of information? Networking, I think, is probably the sort of the general. Thing that's important here not working as isolated you know not in silos but um this sort of thing where we're cr crossing between countries and uh, and professions and that sort of thing and so um networking conferences uh, special interest groups can be fantastic um mm. resmag for example um did a fantastic uh, members meeting recently and they'll have this in different professions um and we focus on standards um mm. and there's a guest guest speaker from BES, in fact, um, oh. <laughs> Baron, Baron did a fantastic job. It just did give us yeah. an overview of the applicable standards um, for our specific field. And so he'd done yeah. a lot of the legwork for us in sort of saying, this is what I think applies to, to each of us. Um, mm -hmm. And there might be times we need to look further than that. But um, yeah, webinars, newsletters. Um, so and not being switched off by the word standards definitely helps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. That open mind. Yeah. <laughs> How about yourself, John? Do you use conferences as well and networking? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely, one hundred percent. I agree with all of that. And um, similarly, we decided the water. We would rely heavily on the PMG, your your posture mobility mm -hmm. group, and um, we have the Irish Posture and Mobility Network, the IPMN, which would be modelled on PMG and and would offer similar, mm -hmm. uh, give similar similar offerings and similarly yeah. guest speakers. Um, I'd be keen to emphasize that the national standards bodies are always looking for people to get involved. So whether mm. it's the British Standards Institute or the National Standards Authority of Ireland or whatever the equivalent might be in a different European um, country, uh, they are, you know, they're a resource, they're there, they'll answer questions and, and they welcome involvement and participation from people in the standards process. But um, as Mark says, you, you need to not be put off by the term standard mm. or by all the terminology that that's associated with it and then you know um emailing list serves and things like that like the assist deck list serve or um the screg the southern counties rehabilitation engineering group and um, so there are fantastic resources there if people do have queries um, yeah. and then individuals i mean a lot of people would know uh, the experts who sit on the, the committees and they can be approached directly with questions and queries um, oh, and thinking, yeah yeah 
that's really helpful i'm just thinking so mm -hmm. what we might be able to do is just put a kind of resource folder up at the along with the webinar link you know with all these various links for yeah, people definitely. So one place. yeah fantastic yeah. make it easy and accessible yeah definitely definitely i think um, it's sorry yeah mark Oh, I was just going to add, probably worth mentioning, um, uh, just by Googling posture management and standards, um, <laughs> it's, it's quite, quite informative, actually. And um, some of the companies are really fantastic at putting information together, Careflex, Seating Matters, BES. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Public Health England have a, a guidance document to do with postural care and people with learning disabilities, for example. It talks mm -hmm. about what, what it is, why it's important, what the benefits are, the barriers of posture management. And even some public engagement videos and things on there um, and nice guideline guidelines as well and um, that's something that all health professionals should be sort of aware of and adhering to and um interesting to read here that there there is um nice guidelines from 2012 um about particularly children with spasticity spasticity i can't say it um children with spasticity um should have 24 our yeah. um, posture yeah. care management programs um, so it says that and that's a requirement for us then to make sure that that happens and so these things are important to uh, to be aware of but yeah that but, sounds uh, great we'll have your slides by the end of this presentation <laughs> um so um let's say that um i've now done my uh, i've done a little bit of research now i've looked into all these different groups and found a few articles a bit of networking how how can these when i found this information about standards how can i sort of incorporate them inc incorporate them into my daily life um it depends mm. <laughs> we had an extra college and everything was it depends it depends on the standard and it depends on what you're trying to do with it or want to mm. do with it and um, some standards are kind of tests with pass fail criteria and some standards are a little bit more prescriptive, but it's very, it's actually very unusual for a standard to be prescriptive. In other words, for a standard to tell you what to do. More mm. typically a standard will just give a sense of if it meets the standard, it passes. If it doesn't, it fails. Um, mm. One that I found extremely helpful against throwing more numbers out is right. ISO 14971, which is the medical devices application of risk management to medical devices. And I found that a very unusual one because it is quite prescriptive. It gives you a lot of mm -hmm. guidance and basically it almost handholds you through the risk assessment process. Mm -hmm. It offers different risk assessment matrices. We're all used to the five by five. Well, those who've done risk assessments will be familiar with the five by five risk assessment matrix, but you can do a three by three or you can do any, any number of different variations. And that standard kind of goes through the different options and explains them. Um, it also, poses a set of questions relating to the medical devices regulations, medical devices directives, essential requirements. So it kind of almost handholds you through the medical devices legislation. Um, mm -hmm. And so those who are involved in, in both prescription, but more specifically manufacture, uh, mm -hmm. and who need to conform to medical devices regs, um, this document is very, very useful in helping to structure that process. Um, so that's, that's one. Another one coming back to the 7176, the wheelchair standards and part 19, which most practitioners are familiar with now. 15 to 20 years ago, almost nobody had heard of that. Mm. Crash testing was novel and new. And um, mm. even this carabiner symbol that we're now used to seeing on wheelchairs, that's a standardized symbol. Back mm. in the day, they had different colored ones. They had different, some would have script or writing saying hook here or, or tied end point or the, 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 well, it wasn't standardized <laughs> to use the term. So yeah. over these, 10 to 15 years that whole aspect it's almost unheard of now that a chair would be put on the market that is not crash tested mm. uh, to the point that you almost don't even have to ask anymore um, yeah. and another aspect of that standard is that those carabiner symbols must be placed on the chair so if you come across a chair and there are not carabiner symbols on it then you need to scratch your head and say is this chair not crash tested mm. so and that actually happened to us once we prescribed a chair which was nominally crash tested but the particular configuration we prescribed it had a reclining back on it. And nobody copped that that wasn't crash tested until we went to mm -hmm. do the quality check at the end. And it was like, where are the carabiner stickers? There aren't any, yeah. they aren't they on it? 
because it's not crash tested, but we were told it was. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, the base model was, but this model isn't. So that, you know, that, that was quite a messy, tricky situation to find yourself in when you're just about to issue a chair to somebody. But basically the chair had to go back and an alternative had to be found. But if it weren't for the standard and if it weren't for actually, it's one thing having the standard, you also have to know about the standard and mm. know some of the detail. And, and for example, that there should be four stickers on, sorry, there should be an appropriate number of stickers on the chair. And that's another aspect to it. Some chairs will have six, or eight mm. stickers, meaning that the chair actually requires six or eight tie downs. So mm. again, this is an, an awareness piece. People need to know about that aspect yeah. of it and and the, the equipment providers more so than the, you know, I mean, practitioners in the field have an awful lot of, of the, the biomedical clinical side of things to be focusing on. And it's really down to the product specialists to, to be on top of that side of the game, in my opinion. Um, mm. And at the prescription stage, this is something that needs to be highlighted. This particular power chair is extra heavy, therefore it needs mm. six tie downs, four at the back and two at the front, or eight tie downs, four at the back and four at the front, or whatever the case may be. So yeah. that's just a case in point of A, a standard being in, in place, and B, then people knowing some aspect, they don't need to know all the content of the standard, but some aspect, some of the more clinically applicable aspects of the standard. Mm and um, applying that into their daily practice that's really interesting and it's it's quite a, a um it's quite an interesting example as well with the crash testing where it's it's i think it's quite a good a good example of having something that you know might have been you know quite foreign to some um but because you know of something like something as simple as a sticker it's something that people have become so aware of that you know they know that they need to look for it uh, mm. i'm wondering if it's something similar that you need to apply when it comes to you know uh, seating standards or wheelchair standards. Say, say again, sorry, Sophie. So I was just uh, I was just commenting on what you're saying about how you know crash testing was something you know where ten to fifteen years ago people you know it wasn't something that people were as aware of and yeah. it's sort of an interesting example of taking something that people in the beginning might have seen as quite you know advanced and and might all be you know might be quite foreign to them and mm -hmm. then you've sort of solve that issue by having you know a sticker that people know that they need to look for whenever they're prescribing um, a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. a really good broader point isn't it about how standards get translated simply and understandably into everyday practice and yeah, who's exactly. responsible for that and how can we make it simpler and I know we'll touch on that I think a bit later on won't we because it's a really important point isn't it because standards on the shelf don't don't help anybody. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. How about you, Mark? Do you have anything that you want to sort of like add to some of the stuff yeah. that John talked about? Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. It needs to work on different levels, doesn't it? And stand needs to yeah. be in somebody's face on one level and um, in the background on another level. Um, and also, I think um, in terms of incorporating a daily practice, it needs to be a priority for those at the top managers, uh, mm. and those at the bottom, those working, you know, on the ground, if you like. And so the top needs to show it's really important. Mm. Um, that's how we kind of champion it and and uh, make sure that we're using things um discussing it maybe having sort of journal club style um sessions with the teams to talk about different standards how do they apply to us do we need to do mm. um and then those that are working on the ground need to recognize um what's going on and report problems where they're happening and sort of and query things and so and all need to be uh you know engaged in making th making sure things are improving and that mm. we don't just um stay still because if you try and stay still um you're going to slip away aren't you you're going to yeah. kind of get left behind uh, yeah. yes <laughs> backwards so um yeah standards can be something a bit like um, tapping into research um and seeing what the latest advances are um, yeah another level of that i, I think and um, how involved do clinicians sort of like get when it when it comes to like the procurement process, and and how can they add their sort of clinical judgment to the procurement process? Uh, I'll jump in and say probably not enough clinicians mm. um, need to be at the centre of procurement processes. Um, my experience has been that they're heavily procurement driven, um, mm. and certainly the bottom line is is the cost for every. Um, tender process I've been in, involved in um, and um, and so that we need to really stand up as clinicians and say what is acceptable what's not acceptable um, mm. I think it's about getting involved at an early stage as well so you can be involved in setting the evaluation criteria um, mm. categories the things that we're choosing you know it's, it's really down to 
um, those that know the need, know the patient, mm -hmm. to decide what types of things we need. And then just going with an open mind from there and saying, well, there could be something on the market I don't know about that's going to be great. It's going to challenge us and not just stick into what I know. So I think yeah. this is a really good process to do as a as a clinician as well, um, to engage yourself in a in a tender process. Um, and if you if you get frustrated about what's available to you in your area, you, you know, bed positioning aids, if you're in a community or mm -hmm. pressure even things or wheelchairs, then it's the, it's the the best way to make a change really is to be involved in those choosing mm. to choose from yeah yeah, yeah definitely. definitely point isn't it and at that point you can also incorporate where standards are important but it is part of that evaluation criteria it's a pass fail so you've got that security then that anything that is then put onto the tender is appropriate so that's a really good point mm. How about you, John? Do you have anything uh, you'd like to add about the yeah. I, I, I've had this conversation uh, in the relatively recent past, and I think things work quite differently in different parts of the UK. Mm. England, Scotland and Wales have different systems for procurement and one thing or another. Um, over here, the equivalent of the NHS is called the HSE, mm. and it wasn't without its flaws, but they did do a very good um, first go at a procurement process for manual and power wheelchairs and, and cushions and they involved in around 20 clinicians in the process I think 17 maybe and what they did was they invited tender submissions all the equipment was gathered together and the mm -hmm. clinicians participated with the commissioners in an evaluation of the products um, and they were consulted on the, the, the criteria as well and standards would have played a role in that and for example um, that uh, chairs would be provided with posture positioning belts as opposed to seat belts. So mm. belts that actually perform a positioning function are, are mandatory now in contract equipment. Mm. So that, that was just one case in point. So it's yeah. uh, the, the procurement thing I think varies massively from region to region. But yeah. um, I do think it's really important and it was insightful, I feel, of, of the, the, if you like, the administrative um, people in, in the HSE to get the clinicians involved and, and to take the consultation um, to sorry employ a consultation process and to take the, the comments on board which they did do um, so that that was very helpful now it was very protracted um, mm. but and it's, it's a first go and it's not perfect but it, it's a start Thanks. yeah definitely okay um my next question is i think we've touched uh, about it a little bit but can you sort of share any examples of where you've used your best practices and standards in your your working life yeah um as you say we've touched on it a little bit already but a couple of more mm. examples would be um flame resistance so there are european standards and there's a, a british standard as well which applies this side of the water under our furniture and furnishings regulations. So everything that we mm -hmm. produce must meet the CRIB 5 composite test standard, which is, is quite restrictive. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you're down to the risk assessment piece. What's the likelihood of, of someone being involved in a, in, a, in a fire incident? And what's the severity of harm if that were to occur? Um, and you could argue that the likelihood is lower because someone is sitting on a sitting in their piece of equipment all the time. It's different from a, a sofa over there in that side of the room. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but their mobility is impaired. So that has to be factored in. So the advice we're working to at the moment is CRIB5 composite testing, which is more stringent than maybe elsewhere. Um, mm. But it does lend that layer of, of, of assurance that what we're producing is, is, is flame resistant to, to a high level. Mm -hmm. um, the transport I've touched on already, um, mm -hmm. but that would be applied on a, on a daily basis practically. Yeah. Um, and that applies also in the standard. It's not just related to the wheelchair, the wheelchair structure, but there's a whole section on the appropriate routing fixture and routing of the wheelchair tie downs and the mm. appropriate routing of the occupant restraints. And we as equipment providers and manufacturers have a duty of care to ensure that what we put together for somebody doesn't impede the routing of the occupant restraint system. So mm -hmm. the seatbelt for a wheelchair occupant should follow exactly the same routing as the seatbelt for a regular vehicle seat occupant. So the idea being that it loads the, the, the musculoskeletal components, the, the mid-sternal mid region, the mid-clavicular region, mm -hmm. and sub-ASIS. And that is really important. Um, 
if uh, the lower pelvic component of the occupant restraint, and I don't mean the pelvic support strap, the postural support strap, I mean the, the vehicle occupant restraint, needs to mirror the pelvic support in its, in its mm -hmm. positioning sub ASIS, below the ASIS region, or else in a frontal impact, you risk um, what's termed submarining, the person sliding underneath the mm -hmm. occupant restraint and the occupant restraint riding up into their abdominal region and causing internal um, injuries there, the soft tissue wow. injuries. Yeah. So that is covered in the standards, um, mm. but people might not be aware of it, um, mm -hmm. but, but it is there. So that would apply on, on a daily basis as well. Um, and then in terms of, of, then product, in terms of um, another piece, sorry, you mentioned best, best practice. So again, we have the best practice guideline on transport, wheelchair, occupied wheelchair transportation. And that came about because of a lack of legislation in the field. We had at the time a guideline document from the MHRA, um, and, but very little legislation. The, the legislation in Ireland dates back to 1967. I'm not sure what the UK no. uh, requirement yeah. is. Um, and there was a requirement for a four point tie down and an occupant a lap belt only, no mm. requirement for an upper section. So again, if you think of someone mm -hmm. sitting with a lap belt only in a frontal impact, yeah. what's that going to do to them? So mm. um, the best practice guideline document was developed over about a 12 to 18 month period. And it now provides one single reference source for all things transport related. Um, and it's undergone one revision already, uh, headed up by Bob Appleyard, and it's in the process, I understand, of undergoing a second revision. And a question that came to me literally in the last week or two was, what if a chair is involved, is in a vehicle that's involved in an accident? And you would mm. think that that's black and white. Right? If a vehicle's been in an accident, the chair is damaged, don't use it again. Yeah, but is it black and white or is it a gray area? Yeah. And what if the vehicle was reversing and it, it had a, a sort of a fender bender, just tipped into another vehicle in a car park? What mm. then? So this is something that actually is not covered under the by the guideline, but it's a question now for the next revision. How yeah. do we risk assess that? And, and I thought that. So um, that would be a best practice guideline that that's kind of pulling together a number of different standards, and it, it looks at head head support positioning and uh, a head support offering some element of head restraint, even though that it's not its intended purpose. That's not what it's de mm. designed for it can't be denied that it will offer some degree of, of head neck protection in a low speed rear vehicle impact so sorry not to, a lot of words there one spot basically if, if, if a vehicle is struck at low speed from behind and a person has a head restraint head support that's correctly positioned close to the back of their head it may offer some degree of protection so it's considered best practice to use a head support with a view mm. to acting as a head restraint even though it's not designed as a head restraint and a head restraint is designed specifically to pre prevent rearward movement of the head in, in low speed. Mm. Impact. And then finally, um, would be, I'm not sure this is best practice document, but I know articles have been written on the topic of pelvic positioning belts and the correct positioning of pelvic mm. positioning belts. So again, clinically, that's very important. And a, and a, a pelvic belt that's at 45 degrees linked into attached perhaps where the back support meets the seat rail is not going to do much by way of postural support. And there, there are solid mm. documents written about how to correctly position secondary supports and public positioning supports. <clears throat> and sorry, I'm saying going now into the area of, of um, the safety of, of secondary support harnesses and chest harnesses and the risk of choking and that sort of stuff. So mm. the importance of correctly positioning the, the pelvic support strap first, and then the importance of correctly setting up and positioning and monitoring the use of the chest harness. So again, there would be guidelines there in relation to all of that, not standard yeah. and say the best practice guidelines. So these would all, collectively, these would all have a huge impact on how we function on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the selection and provision yeah. of equipment, and then the training of the end users. And mm. that's, that's a very important point to, to, to mention is tailoring the information that you're giving and the manner in which you're giving the information to the person to whom you're you're giving it and, and factoring yeah. that in and maybe explaining and, and providing information on what to do and how to do it and then maybe observing the person doing it the carer or the mm -hmm. parent and offering tips and guidelines in, in pelvic positioning or chest harness use or, or, or head yeah. head support use. Yeah. 
I mean, there's some excellent points in there. I'm just thinking again with the, the British standard, the 8625, and how that can be brought to life. Because um, as you're saying, a lot of these, you know, it kind of exists on the pages about, you know, what, why, where and how, but actually bringing it to life in, in a practical sense and diagrammatically and, and then actually showing it. So that's, again, something as a resource. So if we could put obviously mm -hmm. the, the link to the standard, but I think we'll talk about in a bit about how we bring these standards to life, who should bring them to life and how can mm -hmm. we do that? Because that's really excellent point isn't it mm -hmm. how about you mark how um can you share any like examples or experiences that you have um when it comes to using standards and best practices yeah probably the best example is um worked recently with a colleague on a customized headrest and um mm -hmm. it's a bit different um and it was 3d printed uh, particularly to try to get quite a lot of lateral support for around the head um shape to the person's head and so this was sort of stepping outside of sort of um what's off the shelf and um because it was mm. a sort of unusual manufacturer we thought it was important to have a look at standards and um surprise surprise there was a standard about how a postural support should be tested including headrests um similar to lateral mm. support i think it's in the, the wheelchair series 7176 um and so yeah. that was really helpful to sort of recommend to us ways that we could strength test the equipment basically see is it going to fail is it going to be appropriate for use and so a very specific example maybe a specific one to sort of customize seating but um it's um it's good to see that we've got somewhere to go to help us to to know how how best and and obviously the companies that are producing headrests for example are, are testing to those same standards and so we can compare and uh, um yeah that gives them a lot of reassurance and uh, one one last thing to, to mention is more best practice but uh working a lot in the field of pressure ulcers and so um it's, it's something that there's a lot of um misnomers about like uh, myths if you like um and um mm -hmm. every now every few years there's an update to pressure ulcers and seating guidelines and um our, our pupus team here worked with the all wales tissue viability nurse forum to, to do an updated guidance to do with um, pressure ulcers and seating as that's available i believe on the pmg website as well um and and so yeah there's plenty plenty of different resources depending on what we're interested in but yeah, yeah. The, the risk around um transportation has got to be the biggest one hasn't it for, mm -hmm. for those that um that we see in in, in seating uh, the biggies i suppose are transportation um stability of the actual um seating system and wheelchair itself um, and pressure ulcers maybe they're the top three but um, transportation is definitely a biggie and so there's probably more standards around transportation yeah. vehicles yeah great great um and i think so diane has sort of like touched upon it a little bit um when it comes to sort of like standards and, and best practices who do you think should sort of be responsible for making them more digestible and accessible and available Oh, good question, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was I was thinking about a top tip, um, you know, to, as as part of this, and I, my, my mm. one was um, not not everyone finds standards um, interesting, but some people find yeah. it fascinating, and so for me, what I find important is to surround myself to connect with people that that do um and and they'll rub off on me um i'll learn from them um and yeah just learning to, to really value them and what what they can give um in terms of sort of the checks and the balances that they can apply and and you know they might love just dipping into the detail or something if you're not a detailed mm -hmm. person get alongside the detailed person so recruit them join a working group whatever it is network um, yes yeah, so that'd be my little tip for, for how you <laughs> how you stay stay abreast of all the changes. <laughs> I'm not sure that answered your question though, Sophie. <laughs> yes, I suppose it's 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 almost like you need to sort of like see, look into your own sort of everyday practice and then try and then filter, you know, what standards and best practices will will work for, for the the sort of like the um the topic or the the project or the issue that you are having or, or dealing with um and then as a result of that seek out the, the relevant information um which you guys have been really good at sharing with us mm -hmm. um, yeah the only other thing i'd add is that i, I think it, each of us or certainly every department should have a compilation you know scope and compile the the standards that you believe apply to to yourselves 
Um, mm. have, it all, have it all in one place. You've got a reference library. It doesn't feel scary. Then if you need to delve into it, you can share that amongst your team and um, have it as a central place on a shared drive or whatever. Um, yeah. I believe that's actually a requirement of having a quality management system is to know your standards that you're mm. applying to and um, you have to reference them. So, um, yeah. Another way I think that that's a very valid point. And even if you reflect on what we've discussed, we've really only honed in on two or three or four. Yeah. So there are 20 something, 26 or 7 or 8 of the wheelchair ones, and I think there are 14 or 15 of the seating ones. An awful lot of those don't apply. Sorry, it's not that they don't apply, that they're almost invisible to mm. the clinical practitioner. They're, you just have confidence when you're ordering a product from a, from a reputable provider that they will conform to the relevant standards. What, it's not part of your day-to-day -day bread and butter to know what those relevant standards are, but there are three or four or five critical ones that would really inform practice. And we've touched on most of those now. Mm. Um, so while it might, I, I strongly concur with what Mark said there about having kind of a, a repository or even just a, a database listing the standards, but then mm. highlighting very clearly which ones would have uh, an impact on your day-to-day -day clinical practice. And suddenly you'll whittle it right down and it won't seem as daunting. I suppose that's the point I'm trying mm. to make, not to be daunted yeah. by them. A lot of them would apply to manufacturers to equip mm. manufacturers, wheelchair manufacturers. And um, like there are, let's say there are wheelchair drop tests. There's a rolling road test, which bumps the wheelchair to simulate how many thousand or hundreds of thousands bumps up and down a curb those aren't going to impact on you know clinicians aren't going to particularly want to know about that or, or know the detail of that but there would be some then like part 19 of the, the transport one mm -hmm. which would have a direct clinical um, relevance and I suppose to answer your question Sophie from my perspective is to reflect on your clinical practice and to reflect mm -hmm. on how it might be enhanced and simplified yeah. again standards medical devices regs and risk assessment are all inherently bound up with each other and i'm always at pains mm -hmm. to emphasize people think risk assessment and it looks like this onerous process i see risk mm -hmm. assessment as an enabler yeah and to come back to that early question can you go can you you know kind of go in can you not ignore a standard but go against a standard or whatever mm -hmm. yes as, as mark said provided you document it clearly and you do your your risk assessment so your risk assessment is an enabler to enable you to do things that you might otherwise feel constrained mm. about doing and um, so i would see risk assessment and standards as tools of empowerment and tools of kind of life simplification <laughs> you know yes yeah, a bit yeah, of a hump definitely. to get over but once you get over that hump it should make life easier and not yeah not I love that okay. term enabling. I think that's absolutely fantastic yeah. because it is that completely different perception, isn't it? Rather than it being something that's holding you back, it's something that actually allows you to move forward. And, a, and another really interesting point there, I think, John, was your point about some clinical kind of usage standards being more appropriate. Some others that are sort of implicit because it's more manufacturer driven, but still important yeah. that it's considered at a procurement stage, oh, particularly yes. where yeah. cost elements come in. You know, it's just got to make sure that we're not sneaking some things under the radar through the procurement end that we then in, in practice assume uh, understandably that they mm. kind of tick the boxes so I love that you know that we've got the full cache of, of standards we've got the priority ones that we know day to day are going to be more relevant but that we're aware of the others so when there is a tender process or stakeholder evaluation involvement that we're like make sure that 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 that's done um, so that I think is really really important point you raised there super Lovely. Well, I think um, it's already time for our last question. Um, time flies when you're having fun <laughs> talking about standards. Um, so Mark talked about it briefly, but do you guys have any sort of like last tips or considerations for our audience when it comes to best practices and standards? I think you need to set aside time. Mm. you need to ring fence it might only be half an hour a week or an hour a week but i think someone every independent entity department or service or whatever term is appropriate should have someone charged with kind of standards awareness best practice awareness and that person would need an amount of protected time on a weekly basis mm -hmm. to do that work and it, Again, I'm really keen to emphasize it is not daunting. It might appear it at the start, but it's actually not when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it. Mm. 
great. How about you, Mark? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting when we talk about standards, isn't it? None of us want, you know, have a goal in life to be standard. We always want to be better than standard in the in what we do in the care we give or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but so maybe standards, uh, I can see it, we can see it as a bit of a, a um, foundation rock um, of what we do. Um, but maybe like John was saying, it could be more than that, it could be a, a springboard. Um, it can really enable us to, to go on and um, do things in a more effective, um, productive way. Um, it's a sort of a, a minimum standard, if you like. Um, and um, yeah, so hopefully, and I think the, the thing is that whether we're somebody new in our career and we're wanting to learn about how things work in, in posture management, for example, um, get, in, get into the standards, um, pick a couple, you know, learn them. Or if you're really experienced, there's always, you, you can always go deeper, can't you? And look for a mm -hmm. level and really challenge your practice. And if we're not challenging our practice, um, then we're, you know, not moving forward. And so um, standards can really help help us in that as well, I think. So yeah. I'm certainly sort of more um, pumped up about it after doing this webinar anyway. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, do you have any uh, funny thing you want to say, Dan? No, I just a, a massive thank you, I think, for sharing all of that knowledge, experience and, and actually, as you say, really inspiring us to to not be frightened of them at all, to see them as enabling and, and taking us forward and, and as benchmarks and, and bringing us, a, you know, bring us a lot more into improved outcomes, which is great. So huge thank you from me um, to all of you for that. And um, yeah, as we said earlier in the presentation, we'll make sure to make, you know, all of the different resources that we mentioned um, into a separate slide. So um, we should be able to access those um, and have a read and hopefully um, you'll be able to find something use useful that you can incorporate into your everyday work life. Well, um, yeah, thank you again, Mark. And thank you again, John. It's been so good having you here. And um, yeah, have a lovely day. Thank you again for watching our webinar about standards and best practices in seating and postural management. We hope it gave you some new perspectives and insights into why standards are important and how they can be integrated into everyday work life. To sum up the key points from the webinar, standards and best practices ensure quality and make sure things are safe for the end user and the same standardized expectations for care exist. It's important to include clinicians in the procurement process to ensure that the equipment lives up to the various standards and provides the best postural outcome. It's not a necessity to know every standard, but it is important to do the groundwork, to filter through and figure out which standards apply to you, whether it's as a clinician or wheelchair manufacturer. Standards can be dry to some and fascinating to others. To understand and navigate standards, it can be helpful to reach out to organizations or working groups that can guide you in the right direction. We hope that this is a step in the right direction towards understanding and integrating standards and best practices in postural management. We hope to inspire clinicians and the key decision makers to be empowered and make the necessary changes to improve our healthcare system. We are more than ready to include and gather more people and organizations in our movement towards a healthcare system where there'll be no harm and lots of power. Thank you for your time.